Hello and welcome back to another episode of Survive the Wild with me, Dan. In today's episode, I'm going walkabout again and we're going to visit an old military uh, training camp. Uh, walk past a lovely reservoir along a pack, an ancient pack horse trail to one of the best views, I think, the Peak District has to offer. And I'm all doing this within the local restrictions of lockdown three. So stay tuned and enjoy. And this is what is left of the camp. This is actually the first time I've been in here, but pretty much all that is left. You can see this is the, the base of where all the huts were. Line after line of huts. Just to think, 11,000 men were here when it was designed for a third of that. This looks pretty cool where this tree's grown, right in front of this entrance. So this would have been the entrance in. And I'm guessing to the side there have been just rows of bunks stretching as far back as there but very different now very different and this is quite a big site as well this but yeah Interesting. So I'm still walking up. This is getting to the end of this bunk. I think we're at, this is about it here. How long that is? And there's, so there's one behind that, that way, and then there's a bit of a gap. I can see at least another two. So, God knows how many were actually in here. All these bunks. I'll have to do a proper explore of this place. Alright, let's follow this path up here. Oh, looks like someone's got their own modern day camp going. Complete with chairs. I don't want to walk too far that way because there is there are people actually still living on this side just behind me there is a, um, a permanent travelers encampment so uh, yeah don't want to go too far that way I wonder what this was I mean it's full of water now no idea no idea at all. Even though there are a few people around, it's just like eerily quiet. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit strange. Actually, I'm just looking. Is that the... I don't know, that must be the side of another bunk up, up against it, surely. I'm just looking here because you can see the edge of this one. But then there's a row. They're basically to the side of it, there's a row of trees there, so that's that's got to be one, then a gap, and then the next one. 
And then, oh, you can see there's some steps. They just come out. Yeah, must do. And then leads to whatever this was. Ah. You can just see there's like one, two, three, another three rows going that way. Apparently, Sheffield University, their archaeological department, have done sur surveys around here, but apparently they've never done one here, which is a bit surprising, really. I'd love to bring my metal detector up here, just to see what gets, you know, what bring, what comes up. Be really interesting. You know, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of history here. So yeah, a bit of uh, history on this site. Um, so first off, it was designed as a uh, military base for the, uh, uh, well, training camp for the Sheffield Battalion before they went off to fight in Europe. Uh, there was one person imprisoned here um, during the First World War, his name was Carl Donitz. Um, and he actually managed to escape. I can't remember the, exactly how. I think he managed to fake an illness to get transferred to a hospital and then escape from hospital. Um, much to the regret of the British or the Western Allies in the Second World War, because he went on to be uh, the U-boat commander, I believe. Or very high up ranking in the U-boats. So, uh, yeah, somebody uh, really slipped up on that one. But then, in World War II, this became the largest POW camp, or prisoner of war camp, in the uh, in Britain, goes on for quite a way. It's a big place. It was a big place, and just imagine being camped here in winter. I mean, it gets bitterly cold. I say around about minus five last night. It gets colder than that, and it probably it would have done by then. It would have been a lot colder. So I really would not have en envied the troops training here or the uh, POWs in prison here through the winter. Fine through the summer, apart from the midges, a lot of midges up here. But this bit of the walk I've never done before. Uh, in fact, I've never been in there. So that was interesting. I'm going to explore that a little bit more, I think, on my own at another date. So yeah, this place is steeped in history. This old pack horse trail goes all the way up to Stanage Edge, spans from east to west, cuts through Sheffield, and uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's some evidence to suggest it dates back to Roman times. But you can still see some of the old slabs further up, which I'll show you when we get up there. I actually feel blessed today. Beautiful weather, hardly a breath of breeze at all. And I've got that view. So this is the top part, uh, sorry, the bottom of Red Myers. There's actually three of these reservoirs. Um, and the Pack Horse Trail used to go up through, right through the middle of here. And then up along that ridge over there in the distance. And that's where we're gonna be going.
flight there was a bit tricky. I'd have filmed it, but there were quite a few people there. Surprisingly busy. But, you know what? You can understand why. You know, when all these people, you know, there's all these restrictions. You can't go to work. You can't do this. You can't do that. Yeah, I gotta think, almost why not? Even if it does make it awkward for filming, and you're trying to look round corners to make sure no one's coming and all that jazz. But, you know, when the scenery's like this, it's nice and crisp and the air is still. Yeah. And it is, I'll just stop a minute. It's quite peaceful. It is quite peaceful. Well, climbing up fairly high now. And uh, to this side of me was uh, Stanish Plantation. It was a lovely for, uh, pine plantation, really mature. Uh, pines, obviously, uh, and uh, yeah, a few years ago they decided to harvest it. They left a strip down this side, but they weren't thinking that the prevailing wind comes from that way, and the first proper storm that blew in blew most of them over. And uh, in fact, I walked up here uh, a few winters ago trying to get to Robin Hood's cave where I camped for the night back in it was a February very cold February day and it took me two hours just to get up there to navigate all the tangle of all the trees but they have it's all these little poles all over the place they have replanted it which is good it's just going to take a long time before it looks nice again So along this section you can still see both sides of the trail. A couple of places you can even see where the uh, grooves are from the wagon wheels. And this, and this is what you're greeted with when you get to Stanage Edge. A spectacular view. Got a bit of a stiff breeze now, so apologies if it's interfering with the uh, audio quality. But what can I tell you about Standage Edge? Well, it is enjoyed by walkers and uh, particularly climbers. It's well renowned apparently for uh, climbing routes. There's no particularly high sections on here, um, but there's Apparently, I don't know a couple of people who do climbing. It's got every type of technical route you can imagine. So a lot of people come here to practice. People come here from all over the world. Uh, but it is also has the claim of Britain's longest inland cliff. And uh, when you get to the high point you can really see why.
so you can see the causeway now where it goes off that way it just hugs the other side of those trees and then down along that way there's a it splits back there there's one route that goes off that way which would take you towards Glossop and Manchester and then another one that drops down into Hope Valley but we are going to go to uh, High Nep which is over there there's a slight breeze that's just picking up that's why I've got the, the old noggin warmer on because it's a bit cold on the ears and I'm surprised I've not got ice in my moustache yet oh. right. climb this <laughs> And uh, here we are, finally at High Neb. I believe this is the highest point on Stanage itself. It's oh, it's. I uh, tell you what, it's it's cold up here. Not a bad view, not a bad view at all. Actually, some of this is uh, some of this is snow, but I don't know if you can make out across the valley. You can see where the actual snow line is. Mamtor over there. And then over in the distance, Kinder Scout, which is the highest peak in the Peak District. It's amazing but having this on my doorstep, I can walk out to here. Oh, it's always a bit breezy on here, obviously, because you know we're quite high up. There's not a lot between here and anywhere really. This is quite a high point. Well, that is pretty much it, guys. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this walk and you've learnt something along the way. I certainly have. Don't fly your drone too close to a cliff. <laughs> uh, but yes, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you subscribe. Give me the thumbs up. I've got a big subscriber giveaway coming up when we hit that 5,000 subscriber mark, which isn't going to be that far off. Uh, the rate of subscribers I'm gaining at the moment is getting good to when, a few years ago, when I was gaining 200 subscribers a month. I'm about halfway to that, which is brilliant. Uh, that gives me a good spur on. So, uh, yes. I will actually do a video on me making the giveaway prize. Because uh, if, if you haven't seen already, uh, I will be giving away a belt with a foraging pouch and a sheath for a Laplander saw with a Laplander, brand new Laplander as well. Uh, I do make and sell these items, obviously not the Laplander, but. Uh, there's about a hundred quids worth of kit there and any budding bushcrafter would yes, they would thoroughly enjoy that prize I am sure so uh, thanks for watching guys and I shall see you in the next video bye for now